You're welcome to First Take on TV3 and 3FM. My name is Jifa Bampo. Today we are in conversation with Dr. Kwesi Jonah, who is a senior research fellow with IDEG. IDEG is the Institute for Democratic Governance. The Codeo team have just finished a three-day workshop reviewing the 2020 elections. And it's for this reason that we are in conversation with Dr. Jonah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, and you're welcome to First Take on TV3 and 3FM. So you were at the Codeo three-day stakeholders workshop about the 2020 elections. Uh, various issues were discussed. Tell us what for you uh, was the major flaw from our 2020 elections? Uh, <laughs> from the discussions that were held there, um, the key issues that came up have to do with first the voter registration now uh, you remember the controversy surrounding whether or not to compile a new voters register now the question now is with the NIA data now available it is data that captures almost all other Ghanaians the coverage now is just about 60 percent but they hope to uh, uh, complete it now is it possible to tap into the NIA data so that we don't have to do the kind of um, continuous, compilation, con continuous the, registration the, and every compilation. Every four years we do a new, and so on and so forth. I, I think what came out is that, yes, it is possible. There is no legal impediment preventing the EC from tapping into it. The only problem is that the NIA registration is not based on polling stations. You have your name there. It, it, it doesn't show what polling station is for. But in the case of the EC, the data is polling station based. Uh, and so the barrier to tapping into the NIA data is not legal. There's no legal impediment whatsoever. It is technical. The good news is that we understand it is technical technically possible also to do that. Another um, problem had to do with declaration of results. So that, that for you is another flaw? Yes. The if, way the results were declared? Yes. You will recall that when we had the first presidential election petition, the Supreme Court issued some orders you know, regarding publication of polling station by polling station uh, results. Now, if you decide to challenge a presidential election results, for example, first, you have a very short period within which to do that. Just three weeks after the declaration of results, and then you go to court, and you don't have the official polling station by polling station results of the EC published anywhere for you to compare that's a problem. And the EC itself has ag had agreed before the 2020 elections that this will happen. The publication of polling station it, 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 results. It, 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 has, it, it, has not, it, it has not happened. People are wondering. Now, you know, the presidential election results are declared region by region. Because all the constituencies in a region, the results will be collated by a regional coalition officer. So unlike in the past, when the returning officer for the presidential elections, the chairperson of the EC, will receive 275 constituency results. Now, the chairperson will receive only 16 results. Beautiful. It is a very useful mechanism. It simplifies and expedites the resource declaration process. What it does not do is to give the public a sense of how are the results going? The idea is yes, to see yes. the results coming it, it in for constituency by constituency. It makes for transparency. Everybody knows how, you know, this also uh, does not happen. And then another issue has to do with coalition. The big, big innovation that the EC introduced in this particular election is the regional coalition of results, presidential mm -hmm. results. For example, Ashanti has 47 constituencies. Mm -hmm. Instead of 
the chairperson of the EC, who is the returning officer for presidential elections, receiving presidential election results for each one of these 47, she will now receive only one result for Ashanti because they've collated or put together the results for all the 47 constituencies. And this is performed by a new officer called regional coalition officer. Now, the question is, a regional coalition officer is doing coalition in the UC regional headquarters. What are the rules and regulations governing this place? Who and who are entitled to be there? What can you challenge and what can you not challenge? And if you challenge something and the regional coalition officer, there, there are no rules. It is a good, a very good mechanism. It makes the result creation process very simple. It also makes it very fast. But so in a few instances, there was confusion at the coalition center. So the time has come for us to look at both the regional coalition process and the constituency coalition process. As it is, the law only provides that there will be a regional coalition officer and then the functions of what he has to do. Those rules and regulations governing the operation of the coalition process at the regional level do not exist at the moment. All right. So, so those are three key things you yeah, yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, the, 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 there's a problem with election violence as well. Mm -hmm. uh, depending upon who is counting, six or eight people died. <laughs> It depends upon which party is coming. Yeah, the country. numbers have varied, five, <laughs> yes, six. Yes, yes. We'll come to talking a, a bit okay. more in detail about okay. that. But without seeming negative, it seems that um, in as much as we did well with this election process, the EC seems to have focused a lot on the preparatory aspects of the electoral process. There's a view that all these things you are mentioning are the post-election process and they took their eye off the ball a bit over there. Let us not forget that in Ghana, every election is an improvement upon the previous one. And so we are making progress. It's just that you cannot keep making mistakes that are avoidable. I'm glad you I'm glad you've mentioned that yes. because in Ghana we spend what something between some seventy million to a hundred million dollars yeah. on elections yeah. every four years over the last three yeah. four year uh, three elections or so. Yet these mistakes keep emerging. Uh, it makes one wonder whether we are really getting value for money in spending all this uh, or investing all this money in elections. The cost of election is one issue and improving upon the process is a completely different issue. There are things you can do which will not cost you one penny. For example, if you aligned your data, voter data, with the registration of the NIA, the two sites sit together and just see how you can transport the data from here, to, it, it, it will not cost you anything. I, I, at all, but I agree with you that once you are spending an awful lot of money <laughs> on the process, one would expect commensurate improvement also with the exp 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 expenditure. Yes. In terms of the expenditures, now we know very well that we spent a lot on a new voters register, on a whole new biometric system. What do you project for 2024, for instance? Do we need to improve or add on to equipment any further? Will we need a new voters register? Good. You are talking about the cost of election administration in this country. Up to now, now that the two of us are sitting here, the cost of administering elections in Ghana is one of the highest in Africa. It used to cost us $13 per voter to run one election. In most countries, $5 is the, is the average. For majority of African countries, and some actually spend less than $5 per voter. So the cost of election administration in Ghana compared to other African countries is very high. The good news coming from the EC at this meeting is that in this particular election, election 2020, 
they were able to reduce by 50%, by half, the cost of administering elections. Meaning that it came down from $13 per voter to approximately $7.5 per voter. Almost, almost about, about roughly half. So it is good news. Second, and most importantly, because we have invested so much money in procuring new equipment, you will not need to spend the same amount of money next election because those equipment will be there. So the cost will go down even further. At the election review workshop, I think two key themes that emerged at this uh, review workshop on our 2020 elections were uh, electoral accountability from the EC and then um, electoral reforms. Let's first talk about electoral accountability. Yes, yes. <laughs> Are you satisfied well, with the electoral accountability and without making it look like one particular party is the only one complaining, there are people who feel that the EC should have answered for some of the issues raised in the, in the electoral process at the election petition, for instance. It is not a one party matter. For example, putting out the police station results for everybody. It should not benefit only one party. So that, that is something the EC did not do. So that we can, on the basis of that, hold you to account. Is there a reason why the EC was not able to put I, out polling? Did they tell the team at they, the they, review? They, they, the only thing we got, the sense we got, was that there was absolutely nothing deliberate. It was just the feasibility of doing it over such a short time. You see, the, the people want the results, uh, police station results, to come out early enough so that in the event that you want to challenge or even for your own uh, 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 accountability purposes and so on and so forth. But the impression you get is that there was absolutely nothing deliberate. They had nothing to hide. There's a view that the EC hasn't been accountable enough. Yeah. The elections were declared per the constitutionally mandated uh, approach where it's done a public declaration and we're given the figures. But subsequent to that, there were some four other amendments and we were informed via press statements. Isn't that yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah, to yeah, be concerned yeah, yeah. about? Yeah, now, you are going into something legal. Okay. Now, there was a Supreme Court judge. At the event, at the Justice Tokono. Who explained that if a public official makes a mistake, subsequently realizes and corrects the mistake publicly in law, there's nothing wrong with it. One of the concerns is that this whole circumstance surrounding the election and the way the EC went about it uh, has dented their reputation a bit. Have they, would you say that they've taken a hit on credibility issues? Oh, if you are a public body and you keep making simple, ordinary uh, mistakes, it, it will definitely affect your uh, reputation. I think going forward, IPAC should find, in Latin say, modus vivendi, a new way of living with the EC, so that more or less collective decision in law, the EC does not have to take decisions from anybody, but IPAC is a convenient mechanism for arriving at a consensus. And I, I think this consensus role of IPAC should be strengthened in such a way that many, many of the disputes that arose before, during the election, will not be a problem in the future. You mentioned IPAC. Uh, the NDC has indicated that it's reviewing its relationship with the Electoral Commission and recently boycotted the first IPAC meeting. The the NDC takes the view that IPAC, led by the EC, tends to take um, unilateral decisions and it is not collaborative enough. The NDC feels that when it's time for IPAC meetings, parties that may not have fulfilled the constitutional requirements that ensure that they are a proper political party suddenly resurrect and come 
to IPAC, decisions are then made, which is then binding on they, the NDC, for instance. They want a review of how IPAC, how no, things uh, are done there. Uh, very simple. To begin with, IPAC is not an institution that is bad by law. There's no law establishing IPAC. You can't say that the EC has breached any law. But in spite of the fact that it's not bad by law, if you want IPAC to serve the purpose for which it was established, it is very important to allow the stakeholders now to participate freely, express their views, and also with the expectation that the views that they express will be taken into due consideration. Now, the issue that you raise, the participation of small parties, uh, some of them haven't met the constitutional requirement. What are the constitutional requirements? You should have offices in all the regions. You should submit audited accounts. Sub Sometimes, the, in, the, in the case of one of them, establishing offices in all the regions and in two-thirds of the, the, of the, of the districts, small small parties never meet, meet that requirement. <laughs> Yes, so, but submitting so, accounts, even some of the big parties also sometimes don't, don't meet that requirement. That, that requirement. So, if you are going to punish, you are going to punish. <laughs> well, I don't think it's about punishing, <laughs> but I think. If, if you're going to exclude, I, I, I think. No, I, I, I know the frustration of the NDC because if you look at the way in which their protest against the registration exercise was received, it's like almost all the small parties sided with the EC. And that is why they are raising this question of parties that don't meet the requirement. You know, to be very honest with you, the small parties will never be able to meet those constitutional requirements. And I think that if we ban them from politics, the NDC itself will not be very happy. I don't think it's about banning, but I think what the, the NDC is looking at is ensuring that there's a certain fairness. Yes. in the whole process and that and that fairness will not come from looking at some parties that don't, don't meet a uh, requirement that fairness should lie with the easy that every major player in this process is listened to and if there are differences to make sure that the differences are resolved in a way that gives satisfaction to both both, both parties i don't think that is happening enough what kind of commitment would you want to see from the EC in an effort to address I, I the issues of electoral reform, the issues relating to how IPAC operates going forward? Yeah. Moving forward, I think a lot of uh, uh, proposals for reform are coming from not only just this review, but from the observer, observer, observer reports of other observer missions. It is important for the EC to list them. And all these bodies will engage the EC anyway. So the EC is going to ha receive a copy of the recommendation they make. I, I think the EC this time around should set up an internal committee, reform committee that ensures that the recommendations, at least those ones that it agrees with, are implemented before next election. Two, I pack, you, we hardly ever take a vote. I, I, I say we because I remember I, I represent a civil society organization. Okay. I, 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 I did. In fact, the civil society organizations, we are plenty, but you don't have a vote. You, don't, you are not even allowed to, to talk. You are observers. <laughs> you are observers. So I think going forward, knowing that this is the situation with IPAC, listen to the key, identify the key stakeholders from the not so big key stakeholders because the reality is that. In the election, two parties, the NDC and the NPP, always obtain about 98.5% to 99% of the vote. So make sure that you listen to the views of the key stakeholders as you pay attention to the views of the key stakeholders. Otherwise, somebody is going to always complain that parties that are not able to meet whatever requirement, you know, they, 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 these are the two key, they, if they obtain the two of them account for 98.5% of the vote, what they say should matter. We've talked a bit about the EC's credibility and accountability and what IPAC should look like going forward. But electoral reforms has come up. What do you make of this suggestion that EC officials that 
had caused a, a mishap in terms of some of the electoral results should be held accountable for that through the EC's own internal disciplinary um, no, the, approaches. The, the, the matter came up. There were some EC officials at various constituency levels who committed uh, various offenses. Some of them were cheering <laughs> the images of some of the candidates. So, so many things happened. Some probably recorded uh, uh, wrong results, which is why the NDC and even the NPP those, complain of, you know, the cases, results being altered in some instances. A lot of those cases have been duly investigated. Many of the culprits identified are being tried in various courts. It's just that the public doesn't know enough about these processes. And that is why they think that there's impunity. They are, they, they are, they are, some of them, some people say they have gotten away. It is not true. The police were there. The, you know, the, it is the police. Once they, you commit an offence, they hand you over to the police. It becomes a police matter. So the police, the police are the, taking these yeah, individuals through yeah, process. They, they, some of them are going. Are going, are going did, did they give a figure of how many people? No, no. Okay, but they are taking them. That is separate from people who committed acts of violence during that, that's complete, the elections. That, that's, that's a completely separate matter. And that mm -hmm. one too, they gave us the assurance that some have been investigated and people are already in court. How do you um, expunge this view of impunity in electoral processes? Because that is how a lot of uh, members of the public think, that people act with impunity, they get away with it, and no one is adequately punished. Uh, Okay, there may be a certain level of impunity, but I must say that a lot of it, a lot of the accusations of impunity or suggestions for impunity also sometimes stems from inadequate public information about what is actually being done. So, for example, without this workshop, I wouldn't know that a lot of the people who were responsible for the violence a lot of the people who interfered, the EC officials who interfered, were, have been investigated and were on trial. You know. So yes, uh, I think there is some impunity. But I think also that a lot of the times we allege impunity just because we don't have enough information about what is actually happening. And it is up to the officials and institutions responsible for to make the information available to those of us mm. who do not know. We are now learning from this um, Cordero Election Review Workshop that vigilantism um, in the political party and in operating generally during elections is taking a different this dimension. Is, yeah, yeah. Can you explain what that means? Well, yeah, the, there was a research paper on this. And it's a thorough study of the northern part of the country where vigilante groups are now branching it to um, if you like, um, economic ventures, some of them have become contractors for Rosewood harvesting. The chiefs on whose land this rose, uh, Rosewood can be found have contracted them. They collected taxes for, for the people and pay the chiefs part of it, the, the pocket uh, 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 part of it. What was the danger in the danger, vigilante the, 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 groups? The, the, the danger uh, then is that vigilantism is becoming so profitable. <laughs> okay, maybe the, the reason why I ask what the danger is in that is, isn't it also a way for the vigilantes to turn over a new leaf and become more economically independent because the view is that vigilantes tend to act according to the dictates of their political masters that, that who are was, funding them. That in fact was not the sense I got. Mm. That it is true that the vigilantes joined the vigilante groups because of lack of money. But having become armed and having become used, having become very used to exercising violence The chiefs on whose lands these rose wood trees are harvested find them useful. You are the guys who can do this job. And so if they give up that, the, their ability to inflict violence, they are no longer useful. 
they are, they are no, no longer useful for the purpose of extracting. It's not only rosewood harvesting. Cheko. What about galamse? Illegal galamse as well. So the, I, guess, I guess then the real danger here is that vigilantes are becoming economically powerful and can do what exactly, they want exactly, and, and exactly, get away exactly, with exactly, it, probably. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. How can we stop this? Uh, well, uh, or once, was, were there any suggestions about how to stop well, this? Well, once the security agencies have made aware of this, uh, the, 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 the suggestion, the real suggestion here is that you cannot go about dealing with vigilantes the same old way because they have diversified their activities, they have transformed into a different kind of group altogether. And, and so dealing with them should take into account the transformation that is taking place in that sector. So finally, <laughs> sir, uh, the Kodeo uh, workshop is over. What next? What next? Very simple. In the past, after the election, when you have done a review like this, the report sits on the shelf until next election. You share it with the EC and so on and so forth. This time around, the recommendations made for them to be implemented, a monitoring mechanism is going to be set up, which every year will monitor the extent to which the recommendations made have been implemented. And this is going to be a big, big change. I mean, this is a very good thing that Ecuador has done. So they will monitor yes, the process but, up until, uh, until the, the next until, until, major until, until, elections, until, 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 until elections. And, and then provide and, and maybe recommendations I, I, I must, that we I can... I commend uh, Cordeo. Uh, the workshop itself was very productive. It covered many aspects of the election and the introduction of this monitoring mechanism is a major, major improvement upon the, the mm. event. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonah, for speaking welcome. to us My on pleasure. First Take for TV3 and 3FM. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you for being with us on First Take. You've been watching me having a discussion with Dr. Kwesi Jonah, who is a senior research fellow with the Institute for Democratic Governance, where we've been discussing uh, the outcome of the Kodeo post-election workshop. Thank you for joining us.